Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I I recognise you, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ravin. I'm one of the editors here at Tortoise. Welcome here tonight to our thinking. Um, how many of you have been to thinking before? I see some regulars here. OK. Quite a few newbies. OK, fine. This is a good inauguration, I think. Um, First of all, I just want to say this is a different type of thinking. So normally what happens is this room over here, we turn it around. We all work here. That's why you can probably see a few teacup stains and um, maybe a bit of you know, old coffee cups lying around. But we work here, and then we quickly transform this room for you guys so you can come in here and we can have a discussion or a civilized disagreement, whatever you want to call it, intellectual thought around a topic. But tonight we're doing something a bit different. Um, we've decided that we're going to show a piece of journalism that we've done, and off the back of that, we'd like to have a wider discussion. Um, so this is a bit different. So normally, we'd have a tortoise across the screen, which would be going on for 55 minutes, and we'd have a discussion. Um, but tonight, we're going to show a film, and then we're going to have a discussion off the back of that. Um, if at any point you feel that some issues in the film have affected you anyway, feel free to leave the room um, and take a breather. But hopefully, you won't do that. You'll just sit back and enjoy, and we'll get into the discussion. So. Yeah, Sam. <coughs> a 15-year-old boy, boy has died after being stabbed to death. And we're now getting reports of two people having been rushed to hospital this evening after yet another stabbing. Two uh, teenagers were stabbed. Attack. We're now getting reports of two people having been rushed to hospital this evening after yet another stabbing less than a month. Britain has seen a sharp rise in stabbings. In England and Wales, there have been over 44,000 offences involving a knife or a sharp instrument in the last 12 months. This is a 7% rise, and the highest it's been in eight years. It seems like every week we're seeing another young life lost to knife crime in the UK. Gang violence, drug-related crime, and social media wars have often been blamed, or the ease with which knives can be bought. And with every knife crime incident that takes place, cuts to policing are often blamed for the latest stabbing. If you look at the figures, what you see is that there's no direct correlation between certain crimes and police numbers. But I would be naive uh, to suggest that the reduced numbers of officers on the street for a whole variety of reasons, including, and I'm talking across the country here, including reduced officer numbers overall, has had no impact. I'm sure it's had an impact. Most victims are mainly young and male, with homicides by a knife or a sharp instrument rising more than 59%. Overproportionately, these victims are young black men. We held a thinking in a London college where we spoke to young people about the problem. We heard stories of several stabbings from people who knew and loved the victims. Paul Barnes lost his son Kwamari in 2017. One of my fondest memories of Kwamari, I started playing music on my phone, yeah, and one of my friends was playing music on their phone as well. So we started to have a battle. They had better music for me on the phone. So he jumped up like, no, you're not, you're not going to bury my dad like that. No, you're not, you're not going to kill my dad like that. So he started to play his music on, the, on his phone and he won the competition. They were shocked to see, what, this 15-year-old got music like that. He had all of the tunes on the phone, so he gave them a good hiding. And I think it, was, it went out with a bang. It went out with a bang. I, I, I will never, ever, 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 ever forget that. On the 23rd of January 2017, it was about 3.20, walking out of school, a young lad jumped out on him with a knife. He was running saying, oh, help, 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 help. Someone, he's gonna stab me, he's gonna stab me. This young lad still managed to stab him. He stabbed him three times. And with one of the stabs, he even managed to break his rib. That's how ferocious he went in with one of the stabs. No one came to his aid. They watched this young boy stab him three times. There was adults there. But unfortunately, by the time I got to hospital, I didn't get to see Kamari. But the best thing is his mum got to see him before he passed away. 
you know, and in, in my, in, to myself, yeah, I am so glad he didn't die on the spot. At least his mum got to spend a little, even if it was, a, even if it was five minutes the journey from here to there, you know, she, a comfort to me, but he got to see his mum before he passed and she got to see him. I wouldn't say I've got justice, I've got some form of justice. You know, him getting 14 years, you know, he can come out and have a life. I'm still, I was still living my life sentence. But, you know, that's, that's my life now. I go to the cemetery on a regular basis. You know, and um, it's been, that's been my life for the past two years. You know, it's not nice. A 15 year old was found guilty for murdering him in September 2017. When sentenced, the defendant said, I don't know why I did it. I was scared and confused. Bryce is one of Kumari's best friends. He often spent time with him after school. By the time I got to Wembley, I had heard that he had been stabbed. But I didn't know he was dead until I got home. Mm -hmm. I had no words. And then I knew that that was, that was it. But it really saddened me because I know that had I went to see him now, probably could have still been alive today, but at the same token, had I gone, I could have been dead with him. So the two of us would have been lying next to each other there. Obviously, we live in a very dangerous generation. But especially being a young black male, it's very hard for us all over the place. But all the stuff that young black men in my generation and generations below me seem to get tied up in, that sort of stuff does not fear me. I've got sense to not go down the wrong path. But even sometimes, it's not even about going down the wrong path because Kamari didn't go down the wrong path. Yes, Kamari had certain friends who, you know, but he wasn't on the wrong path. He wasn't someone causing trouble after school or getting himself in mix-up, as we know. And it just goes to show you that sometimes it doesn't matter what, like, way you go down, trouble can catch you at any time. Craig Pinkney is an urban youth specialist and a lecturer at University College Birmingham. He's one of the UK's leading experts on okay, gangs yeah, this and is, serious this is probably the most, This is probably more most relaxed is. Yeah. Is I think before we talk about the concept gang, we can just talk about groups. And the common things generally that these groups of individuals, whether male or female, had something that they wanted or had something that they wanted to keep, whether that was to do with power, whether that was to do with resources. And there was always an opposing group that either wanted or didn't like the fact that they had this something that they all wanted and you would see conflict. We're talking about young people that live in environments where they perceive there to be constant danger. They perceive there to be a threat. They think about other young people that they may have heard about. They may have seen young people being involved in aspects of violence. So they leave their household scared in most cases. You're also talking about young people that live in environments where there's high um, issues of mental health. You know, we're talking about young people that are anxious, depressed, um, they're, they're paranoid because of the things that are taking place within their particular environments. And then we expect young people to kind of navigate their way through life, knowing that these issues exist within their environment. Because when you look at kind of, again, the, the, the breakup or the makeup of what gangs are, they represent what I call in my research surrogate families and gangs operate as such. And when you think about what families have in terms of the safety element, they talk about that belonging element, that, that idea that you can be part of a group and people make you feel that you, you're a part of something that enables you to be safe. I think it's also about economics. I don't think we can never have this conversation about gangs and violence without understanding economics. We live in a capitalized society where young people that live within communities where 
there's issues around high unemployment and lack of resources and lack of opportunity to find work. Those young people need to find ways of making money. And young people are desperate. But at the same time, these young people have been marketed. They're still marketing by the latest pair of trainers, still buy the latest iPhones and Samsungs and so on and so forth. So I think sometimes I think we're too hard on young people. We kind of act like young people are like aliens that have come from a planet and we as adults do not put them in environments where we're forcing these things on them. You know, young people don't own Nike. Young people don't own Adidas, they don't own Puma, they don't own any of these big music labels that want them to make music. They don't own any of these electronic companies that want them to buy their gadgets. But for some reason we say that these young people are not supposed to have these things. I mean, they're supposed to have ways that they're supposed to get it, but then there's no options for them to, to get an opportunity to get those things in the first place. You can have a young person that lives on an estate, a young person that lives on the street, and their next door neighbour may be a family friend and may decide that they take a liking to this particular young person and say, come on, hang out with me for the day. There's no issues, there's no problems, there's no violence. That young person that comes out of the household and starts hanging around with their neighbor may at some particular point in time, may decide that they want to engage in other forms of criminality if that individual is. So that individual may be involved in selling drugs. And that young person may feel that, you know what? I want to get on, I want to get an opportunity. So I wouldn't use the word grooming, I would use the word exploitation. Because I think our young people are being exploited. So when we're talking about, well, how did you join the group? I couldn't tell you a point of when I joined the group because there was already a part of the family anyway. The all-party parliamentary group on knife crime found that councils with large cuts to youth services were more likely to have also seen an increase in knife crime. The average council spending on these services has reduced by 28%. And some argue that they are the best early intervention tools for young vulnerable people. Corey Johnson is a music producer. To keep away from disruptive influences like gangs and violence, Corey's youth charity is trying to create opportunities for young people in business and the arts. So this is the same process when it was like Quadrophena and you had the mods and like the craze and so it's not nothing new except for that these kids aren't making any money. So there's no money in it, there's no, they're not making thousands and thousands of pounds, they're not living a lavish lifestyle. Like this is really just frustrated young people with a lack of something to do. Literally, it's not in their DNA to even be like this. It's not generally, they're not that generation. This is a gap between the generations and a lack of support and services. That's what the main thing is. A lot of these young people are just scared. So they're accessing the knives in the home because it's a lot easier to get. Um, and a lot of them that are carrying knives, they're only carrying it because they don't want to be the victim. So they're thinking, well, I don't want it to happen to me or at least there's a bravado that goes along with it. So we highlight so much of the negative in the media, we don't actually show them any of the positive that's happening. There isn't that belief that that could be them. So what they're seeing every day um, is literally only scaring them when they need to see more inspirational figures and not just in music and entertainment, but in different industries, like people that have come from the same areas, same backgrounds as them, same culture as them and aspire to do some really great things. This reinforces this conversation about the racialized social structures that we live in, which is a racist and hostile socialized structure where we look at um, particular crimes and then we put them towards specific types of groups. You know, we look at issues of terrorism, but when you hear terrorism, it's synonymous with Muslim. And then we get that narrative in the media over and over and over and over again so then when something happens, like quite recently um, in New Zealand, where this individual that is a terrorist that committed those particular acts, we, it's like we're struggling to use the word terrorist, but the action is exactly the same. And I can guarantee if that was a young man that was a Muslim that committed those particular acts, the word ISIS inspired, Al Qaeda inspires, terrorist, jihadist, and all of those words would have been thrown in the front line and the headline um, of our um, papers every single day. So when we're talking about gangs specifically, young people are also aware that when it relates to violence within their communities, they also now believe and perceive violence to come from their own communities and 
only their own communities because the media also help shape thoughts and perception about each other. So if I have a fear in my community, guess who my fear is going to be mostly taught, targeted towards? The people that look like me. With every stabbing that takes place, it's clear we're not learning quickly enough about what could have been done to save a young life. Those that are drawn into the cycle of violence, exploited by the lack of opportunities around them, are the ones that need the help the most. They do not feel protected. They don't think we can protect them enough. So this is what we need to show them. We need to show these young kids, but we could, you're safe. You know, you don't need to care enough to be safe. So unless the government does something about that to show that these kids are safe out there, they're not going to carry, they're not going to stop carrying knives because this, um, they feel protected. <laughs> it breaks my heart, man. It breaks my heart. It does. It breaks my heart to know, but there are babies, man. There are babies. I've had enough because nothing's changed. The government are not doing anything about it. They claim they are. They're not. I'm out here trying to rebuild my life. I won't get, ever get to see my son get married. And I need the government to acknowledge me, not only me, but my children and all of us victims of knife crime. When I wake up and I see the tears in my son and my daughter's eyes, and knowing as a mother I cannot do anything about that, it breaks my heart, OK? And then you're told he's dead. What do you mean my son is dead? But I guess those that like token appreciation for Kamari. Kamari, we, sometimes when we're on the road, Kamari always got a Lucas aid. We work from Harlesden, Willesden, all the way to Harlesden. Kamari drink about four Lucas aid. He did love a Lucas aid though, yeah. And um, I want to say first of all thanks to Paul and Craig because both of you made played such a big role in that, um, and everybody else that was involved in making that. Um, Paul, I want to start with you though first, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, are you okay? Can I get you another beer? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. okay good, good. Um, so it's coming up to three years now to Maury's death in January. Um, how how are you continuing to cope, and like, how does a family continue to grieve? Um, <clears throat> it's been a very hard road, a very hard one. Um, one what I wouldn't like anyone to go down. I wouldn't like to go down it myself. Um, I've coped with it, having good people around me, friends, family members. Um, I've mainly just trying to keep myself distracted from what's happened. So I've just tried to bring myself out of it really, really and you know, it's only, how can I say, it's only just um, a temporary fix. You know, um, still going through it, still on repair, but I'm a lot better now than what I was two years ago. And um, in, in, in the film, you spoke a lot about, <coughs> well, you said, you know, the government's not doing enough, I was not doing much. Um, you know, we know that you go to a lot of marches like Operation Shutdown to make sure there's more awareness. In those, in those two years, obviously like, there's been an increase in the number of offences using knives. We, we see it all the time with the media, and obviously like Craig made that point as well about constantly we're seeing it in the media. Do you, do you, you know, in, in those last two years, have you seen any difference in how it's being engaged with at all, like when you've been monitoring it? No, I haven't seen any change. Anything I've seen is but it's getting a lot worse than what it was. You know, um, the government, they, 
I, right now, they're, they're, they're in a place for themselves where um, they're just trying to get everyone's votes and do whatever they want for the people. So um, they're a bit distracted with the Brexit and everything. And they think, to me, it's like they just throw us a bone. You know, the other day they done a campaign, they want to put knife crime on chicken boxes and things like that. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous. You know, you've got people who, on the ground level, who do a lot of things for these youths out there, and they don't get no form of funding for what they do. You know, where, where they should put all their energy, they, they don't. You know, they don't give the right people funding to do these things. You know, like my man, like Craig over there, you know, he's ground level. He should be funded a lot for what he does with these kids. And there's a lot of people like him out there that do, and they do not get no form of funding. So it's just swings and roundabouts, you know. They try, but there's nothing they can ever do because they haven't got the, uh, the funding to do anything about it. When you, you know when you've spoken to some of these youth workers in your area, what's the kind of things that they've told you they'd like more support in? Apart from more funding, it's, what other things are you hearing? Um, they just, they, just, they just want support. They just want, they just want government support. That's all they want. You know, funding is the main point, but they just, they just want government support, and they're not getting it. They're not getting it. So it's hard for them. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Thanks. Um, so Craig's doing a PhD at the moment on uh, social media and gangs, which is fascinating, and I can't wait to read it. And um, in, in, in the film, you were talking a lot about the, the family, and I was quite interested in the whole thing about like why people get drawn to certain bits of violence and in terms of the family, right? Can you just tell us a bit more about what you're finding in terms of the family, but also with the role of social media and how it might be escalating it? I think uh, the session that I made in the, the um, short piece was that gangs kind of operate like families. I think we kind of look at gangs as kind of, you know, I think Carla said the same thing in one of the quotes, is that we look at it as a new phenomenon. So in my PhD, I'm looking in the 17th and 18th century where there was gangs and there was knife crime and there was kids stabbing each other as young as eight and nine and 10. So we have this new conversation and we say things like, you know, it's getting out of hand and it's a new problem, but it was a problem then too. And I think the conversation more so should be shifted into, well, what were the key factors that one contributed to the environment where young people kind of became gangs um, or engaged in elements of street violence and more importantly, well, why did it change and why did it kind of slow down and why did it reduce? And then we have to have the conversations about well, then what youth work and a role of youth work and organisations had in the early part of this particular country um, in order to kind of um, reduce issues around violence. But I think one of the things that's really important and is key is that young people in our environments don't feel safe. Um, and I think London in specific, when we're talking about knife crime being um, the main... Um, point of conflict um, or use of violence as it relates to young people, as it relates to knives as well. I think it's about understanding well, why would young people join um, groups um, as such, and I think it's the same question that we could apply to each other. You know, someone said to you right now that I don't want you to talk to your, your mum and your dad and your aunties and uncles and brothers and sisters. You think, okay, that was a little bit strange. And even though I might be saying to you right now, that you shouldn't hang around with your parents, family members is because they're a little bit dangerous. Even whilst I'm talking and you might be nodding to me whilst I'm talking, the back of your head is like, that doesn't make any sense. So apply that in the context of a young person that lives in the community in an environment where their friends go to the same schools and their parents all know each other, their grandparents also know each other. And we're kind of expecting those same young people to navigate this, their way in a violent environment and somehow be safe knowing that the dangers that exist within society um, exist and for some reason they can't protect themselves. And it's been mentioned already that the impact of austerity, the impact of policing, the impact of um, mental health services, social services, communities, youth and community services, play services, all of those things have been dismantled since 2009, 2010. And in 2019, we're kind of just expecting young people to somehow be safe. You know, there was a British um, medical journal that came out last year, if many remember, and it talked about the violent two hours in London. So the likelihood of a, a young child to be um, stabbed is between half three and half five. But what about if a parent clocks out at 6.15? So what are we telling young people? So we're giving the society this information, assuming that these young people are not also listening to the same information, and we're assuming that they should figure it out. So if I was 13 years old right now, and I hear all of this information every single day, in the same context that I'm saying, don't hang around with your family, I'm going to say, you can't tell me not to hang around with my family because they're going to protect me. Yes, it may be criminal. Yes, they may engage in 
elements may, may be quite dangerous, but the first element is about survival. And all I'm thinking about is survival. I'm not thinking necessarily about the consequences. So when we're talking about strategies of raising the awareness to young people about knives and violent behavior and whatnot, that doesn't engage their fear, doesn't engage their uh, anxiety, doesn't engage in their depression and the trauma and the culture of trauma that exists within communities, as we've just seen, um, and the impact of that particular violence has had on families. And that's across the board. And I think secondary victimization and trauma is also important as well because I'm sure there's many parents in the room that also acknowledge what's going on and watch the TV and hear the news. And you must be petrified for your children, nieces and nephews. So about 13, 14, 15 and 16 year olds that also observe and hear the same information that we as the adults are also um, hearing too. So for me, fear is most definite um, one thing to understand. And I think that when we talk about gangs, as mentioned, it's a racialized term. And I think that when we talk about knife crime, I think it's quite interesting how we use statistics nationally around knife crime. And again, we talk about knife crime, but we don't talk about the use of sharp objects. Because if we're talking about domestic violence and how many men um, stab their partners, if we talk about how many men in pubs break bottles and stab each other, that is not um, structured and formulated as the concept of knife crime but then you'll find then generally, statistically, white males in this country commit more acts of violence with sharp objects than young black males do, but the focus on knife crime only tends to be small in-city communities. So when it's projected, we think, oh yeah, well, the perpetrators and the victims are predominantly young black people. And that's not to say that they're not, but how do we look at statistics and how is that framed? But that then also continues the narrative. And again, if a young child and the wider society is thinking, well, if I'm the perpetrator and I'm the victim, then when I walk out of my house, then the one that I'm going to be scared of is the person that looks like me and him. So it's about understanding the context of violence. So I think that when we're talking about engaging with the issue, I don't think we should focus on gangs. I think we should focus on violence because our society is violent. You know, it's embedded into the fibre of our society. Cartoons, films, soaps. You know, I was saying this earlier that, you know, when my son likes Power Rangers, that's quite violent. But because it's a cartoon and because it's fun, we don't acknowledge it as such. But then when it applies to young people engaging in particular behaviours, for some reason, we distinguish the difference between reality um, and some of the things that we see um, on our platforms as TV and so on and so forth. Who, who are you looking at directly when you talk about the parenting and don't talk to your mum? <laughs> oh, I use it. No, please do talk to your mum. Like, yeah. I was just like, oh, what's Sorry, happening here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, do you know, do, I just want to quick talk about social media, right? Yes. Because that's what you've started to look into and you're looking at social media in Birmingham specifically and you're, you're, you're seeing a lot on the news about how social media is goading kids all the time like so if someone will make a threat to someone on social media through Instagram or Snapchat whatever right you know half these platforms the content disappears after a while so it's the person that saw it that feels a threat what I guess the two questions for you is one is actually what can be done about that because it's unregulated in so many ways. And is it up to the platform to do something themselves? I think, um, I'm not gonna answer it direct, I think I'm gonna go round about and then get to the point as I normally do. I think, again, the way that even the questions are framed, it's kind of similar to the way that the government framed the same question, because you're suggesting that social media is the sole reason why our young people are violent. I argue, let's focus on violence. Let's look at the culture of violence. Let's engage with that first. And then let's look at all of the variables that follow after that that may contribute to violence. So I'm not saying that social media creates issues around violence. Of course it does, but we can't look at that in a silo. We have to also look at the, the issue, because I would argue that young people in our society are violent anyway. And all social media does is create environments of narcissistic behaviour. But I argue that young people will have nihilistic tendencies anyway just because of the environments in which they live in. So when they come into contact with social media platforms that makes them narcissistic, then when things happen in those particular platforms in a social media sphere, then physically, the day after school, after school, someone says, you were taking the piss out of me on social media platform, and that's enough for someone to be quite violent. And I think when people look at it from the outside in and think, well, that's a bit um, extreme, 
But then now we have to also look at the role of the people that comment, the trolls, and the people that also engage, the people that like. You know, there's loads of kind of debates now about shall we take away like buttons, shall we take away um, people that comment, why? Because it's been acknowledged that those individuals have an impact on the way that people behave and also the way that people perceive themselves. We can look at that in terms of women, in terms of concepts of beauty, the nasty things that people say to people on social media and the contribution uh, that also may impact on people's self-image, their self-esteem, their mental health, and so on and so forth. So young people are also being um, treated a particular way or taunted or made to feel um, shameful in certain types of environments, what you then start to find is that um, young people then start to behave in a range of different ways on social media platforms, um, and then that happens in um, the wider society. So all I'm arguing is that social media is the new variable. I'm not arguing that social media is the reason. I'm not saying it's a catalogue of things that also um, contributes to the reason why we're seeing a spike in violence. Um, I'm going to come to the audience in a minute if there's any... OK, we've got one hand up. I'm, but I just want to come first to Lydia Lawrence here, because actually, if you think about the narrative and, and the, me the media's been mentioned a lot, a lot right, it's always, it always feels like it's more around a male narrative that is happening to more to young men. But actually, in the last four years, it's gone up by 74% amongst young women using knives, right? Um, and Lydia actually is the co-founder of the Narrative Empowerment Project, and you're also a knife crime survivor, two-time knife crime survivor, right? Yeah. Um, so, what are you are you seeing a similarity? With what we've just discussed and what the themes that came out in terms of what young women are facing as well, or is it a completely different thing that we need to tackle there? I completely side with uh, Craig. It, it's violence. It's one hundred percent violence. Um, the the you know the girls who stabbed me came from adverse childhood experiences, so they would have had an experience trauma. They would have experienced violence. They would have experienced, you know, sexual abuse, all these things um, before they picked up the knife and stabbed me. So, yeah, I, I coincide. Simple. It's, it's what's it happening in your environment. Yeah. And when you, I know you're, you're looking at, like, preventative methods as well now and how you can help younger people. What kind of things are, are you finding challenging in terms of engaging with them? Well, I've recently... Uh, devised a workshop which was a workshop that explores gang violence but also um, child, adverse childhood experiences and, and, and trauma-informed practice um, and when I delivered it to senior practitioners that work on the field they had told me that they have never done any work that really really talks about trauma-informed practice and that blew me away because I'm thinking you're dealing with trauma every single day dealing with you know everybody's issues when as a practitioner on the field and you're not really getting any work and support to be able to deal with your, the trauma. Um, so for me, I'm, I've now sort of, I'm full throttling to make sure that all the practitioners that are working in this field are, are working as effective as they can to be able to support young people. Thanks for that. Um, there was a couple of hands, I think there was one at the back. Yes. I just, I, I, I'm totally with you on this idea that, that, that violence is the issue. So I'm just kind of thinking in the studies that you've done about, you know, we have a violent society, we've had it for years, but do you think that stems from this kind of basic idea of survival? And you, because you talk a lot about safety, do, do you think that we're kind of inherently violent? And what you see is that we have a violent society because so many people in young children, particularly, like you say, don't feel safe. So they think the only way to feel safe is to be violent. And is that is that kind of what your studies are, are showing us that we're fueling that kind of fight, flight, you know, kind of freeze? I think, I think most definitely a thing the concept of survival. Is, is most important and I think the second thing that I would add to that is um, the culture of the violence as well um, in terms of what people internalise and believe is the way to survive in their particular environment so for example I come from Birmingham so in the West Midlands that issue is guns because West Midlands is the gun crime capital and that's not to say that violence doesn't exist in different parts of the city but the choice of weapon tends to be firearms as opposed to London being a knife so then that's, that goes to my point that yes survival uh, may be the uh, predominant factor, but there's also um, other elements to that. And I think, I guess what I'm saying is, when we're looking at these issues, we can't just look at it through one lens. We have to look at the intersections of culture, race, class, gender. Um, and I think when we start to look at all of these different kind of um, overlaps, it gives us a more rounded understanding of well, what it is, why our young people are doing what they're doing, because there's not one answer. Uh, sorry, can I just, and so do you think, because it's really interesting, like, <coughs> 
I, I just thought what was really interesting about what you said is that as children they're seeing what we see as adults, so particularly, you know, like the 3, 3.30 to 5.30, so yeah. come out of school, that's when they're most vulnerable. And actually, yeah, in my head I never really thought about the fact that, yeah, the kids see that. So, of course, they're like, right, I'm going to walk out the school gate and this is when I'm most likely to be stabbed. Um, so, it's, I suppose, you know, in my head, then I'm thinking, you know, I know they've cut services and that, but the answer is, how do we find a, or is there a way we find a safe space for those children when they finish school because they can't go home, um, you know, because maybe their parents are working late or whatever, but they have somewhere in that time when we've told them they're, you know, should be most scared where they can go and feel safe and then therefore hopefully not feel the need to. And I, and I think that yeah. your question is probably the most profound question yeah. that has been asked for the last 10 years because <laughs> I would say that it's if we know that that is the problem based on all the literature and the reports that have been released, yeah. The fundamental question is why. You know, I take a different approach that they're not distracted by Brexit because if there's a terrorist attack that happened tomorrow, they will find a way to fund things to happen, you know, and not to minimise what happened on the London Bridge. But I'm not from London, and I remember when the issue happened, I came back to London, I think, about four weeks after, and I seen barriers at the side of the bridge, and that would have cost quite a lot of money coming from taxpayers. So I think, again, we need to address the real issues. And I believe that the elephant in the room that we don't talk about, specifically around knife crime, is the racialization of knife crime. And unfortunately, when that young, poor, um, white young girl that also got killed um, and her life got taken by a knife in, in also extreme and fatal safe circumstances, Theresa May calls a roundtable discussion, and then that makes me then think, well, why wasn't there a roundtable discussion okay. when all of the children from different groups? Um, so I, I can't ignore that, and then being an individual that goes to the House of Parliament quite frequently and goes to quite a lot of, you start to realise, well, MPs don't seem to be at the doors as much as, you know, Badger's skin gets used for all different purposes and whatnot, and I don't mean to be humorous about it, but... This is my children that have been affected by that. This is our children that have been affected by it. And it's not just one group of people. It's all groups of young people that seem to be affected. But as long as we continue to look at it and kind of believe the media and, and allow them to kind of program us into thinking that it's only one group of people that have been affected, we're going to continue to have these conversations. Because I can guarantee right now, if this happened in the most affluent areas of London, we would have martial law. The army would be out and we would start seeing interventions happening today. So then you start to think, then why is it that poor, impoverished groups? But this is not a new discussion. It's also a historical one. So again, if we go back to the 17th and 18th century, what were the key things that existed within societies? And this is where we need to bring back youth work. And then it's not just necessarily relying on the government, but the church played a significant role in, church, in uh, youth services historically. So again, it's maybe it's about having new conversations about, well, how do we use finance? Because maybe that we don't necessarily need to wait on the government if the church, the mosque, the temple put millions out of the country to Syria, Afghanistan, to different parts of the African continent, which is brilliant in terms of charity. But imagine if six million just came back to one little area. And this is maybe about we're rethinking about how to how we utilize finances in relation to um, engaging in this issue. Because I just firmly believe that if we sit waiting for the government, um, we're going to be waiting for a very, very, very long time. Well, we will be if we have a hung parliament as well, so... Um, <coughs> and is there someone else with a hand up in the middle? I think we are going to you in a minute. Please. That seems to me to be a big violent... Sorry, so your name? Sorry, so my name's Stuart. Um, in my mind, there's a big difference between being violent and wanting to kill somebody. Um, why is it that the, 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 the violence inside them, or the narcissism, isn't sort of achieved by just being violent as opposed to actually wanting to take someone's life. For me, there's a big jump there. I can answer that for you. So, I was born in prison. My whole, I was set up, my, you know, wasn't set the best set of hands, is what you'd call it. And um, I, did, I had experienced every adverse childhood experience that you could potentially experience. Um, I was a very angry child. I was a bully. I was terrible. I would, I would act out in any way because I didn't want my community to know what was going on in my home, and like my school didn't, you know, all of these things. And I continued to be naughty, and every single day I'd be kicked out of my classroom, and I'd go into the office, and I'd throw the tables and chairs around. I was crazy at six, seven, eight years old. And I went through that um, for a long time, and then I managed to get early intervention. 
I went to a boot camp they took to high security prisons in America uh, to help break up the gangs in Chicago. And it, and it was effective. 136 people in my area went on that course, and only 13 people came out of it. So it was the fittest of the fittest survived. It was not an easy course, but for me, I knew that I needed it. I knew that if I walk away from this, I will continue this violence cycle. And if I work to try and better myself to, to learn that actually all these things that I've been through are not my fault, you know, and I, and I have all these anger and all these things, I managed to like, really whittle through it all. I managed to come out of it, and then I tried my best to try and adapt and change my cycle of, of the violence and all of that. Tried to move out, move, you know, had a job, a nine to five, then I also had a six to one bar job, so I didn't have any time to be in any sort of environment of violence. But because of the pattern, it just, it just keeps on reliving itself. So I got stabbed at 21 on my lunch break at work, which, you know, shouldn't happen, but it's, it's for me, I could have easily been a, a perpetrator if I didn't have that intervention, if I didn't have the support from my schools and um, like the support workers and the social workers that have stayed with me from the beginning to the end, I've still got social workers I speak to today. I've still got support workers and youth workers I still speak to today. And that is a, the, the, the bond and the connection and the support that was available in the community, which is no longer. So I had the intervention and I, I again, would have been, could have potentially been one of the people that stabbed me. I could have been a, a perpetrator. but. You know, I had that mind change of violence is not the key. You know, I was only acting out of violence because of the things that I've experienced. Once you manage to get yourself to a point and understand what you've been through, then violence is no longer around, if that makes sense. I just say, I was trying to, and that's really informative still. It's hard for me to get my but why would you not just say punch somebody, why would you want to kill somebody? I was trying to work out. Because that you, seems... can, you can punch somebody and they, they, they fall on the ground and die. Sure. Violence is, okay. is non acceptable in any form, shape, or form. Nobody should want to hurt anybody. I remember being a person that wanted to hurt people, angry, done some mad, crazy stuff, going to a point where I wouldn't even hurt a fly anymore. No it also goes back to the point I made earlier to um, one of the colleagues at the back about the culture of violence. If your perception and your understanding is that, yeah, it can be violent, but rather than punch, I'd rather use a knife. That becomes a core belief, and that's what the choice of the choice is going to be. But I think it's also important that you also understand as well the culture of violence as it relates to those intersections of race, class, and gender as well. Because those things become quite important. Because if you're talking about um, structural um, oppression or marginalised groups, you're going to see different types of violence, maybe due to the stress and the strain of frustrations from particular types of groups. So I work with young men that say they get stopped and searched nine times more likely than anybody else. I work with young people that say that, you know, um, being sectioned um, and treated in mental health services is a lot different. And this is not justifying the behaviour, but understanding the frustration, and they can't articulate that, may go from wanting to punch a nurse in the face to wanting to stab some random person on the street. So I think it's really important that we understand that and not just look at it as everybody is the same, because we're not the same. You know, we're not the same based in cl on class. We're not the same racially. We're not the same in terms of gender. And I think these things are really important that when we're having this conversation, to not just look at it as, well, a human being, why are they violent versus why an individual wants to punch versus somebody else. And then when you look at the culture of violence, again, there are a lot more violent people in different circles than the current um, scenario that we're talking about now. And I think that even the construct of this kind of discussion, just to nail it on the head, it's three black people having the conversation about this. And again, when I the work that I do, when I work with a lot of violent people that use objects, it's predominantly white males that I work with. But when we're framing it to knife crime, we're talking about specifically street violence as it relates to predominantly young black and Asian males and their families that have been victims by it. If I was to kind of bring into some of the circles that I go into, as I said, domestic violence is major in this country. We're talking about individuals that from organized criminal groups, hooligans are just as violent, um, that fight every weekend, but we don't talk about it, and we don't, we don't structure it or frame it in this particular frame. So we have to start asking questions over why are we still doing the same narrative? So we also have a role to play in the way that we're having this conversation, because if we still keep making documentaries about us, if we keep um, having conversations about us, keep asking questions about us, we also add to the narrative of thinking, well, maybe then it just is us. And I think this is part of the shift, in my opinion, of where do we go forward. And I think, um, as I mentioned before, I think it's conversating about violence and what violence looks like. And I think, how do we kind of put things into place to reduce elements of violence that may be different as it relates to race, class, gender, 
culture, religion, so on and so forth. Um, could be. Um, comment about murder rather than knifing. My experience is that when people use a knife, they're not intent. They don't know whether they're going to kill someone or hurt them. They don't know if I stab them in this place it will kill them and in some this place it won't. So in some ways those that die <coughs> would argue are the unlucky ones. Um, the other thing I'd say, your comment about why don't they just punch each other, I would say from my experience of working with these kids, it requires more courage to punch someone than to stab them with a knife. And many of them are actually very scared and not brave and not very courageous. And most knife fights are quite frenetic. Someone comes in, they slash away, and then they run around the corner. There's not very much intent or plan to the whole thing. And if they happen to stab someone where it kills them, that's just bad luck in some ways. It's not, not some thought out process, I'm afraid. Sorry, what's your name, sir? My name is Paul. Paul, and you, so you say you work with yep. many young people. What, what type of field are you in? I run um, programs across southeast of England for youth criminals. Um, who've either committed crimes and been offended by youth offending or who've been referred to me by Prus. Um And what I do is run boxing classes for them in gyms throughout South East of England. And what they meet in general um, are black positive role models who teach them that you can be strong, you can also be gentle and you can be sensitive and provide them with a a better idea of what being a man is about than what they pick up from watching films and things, things on videos. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for about 15 months, and to be honest, 15 months ago I barely met a young black kid. Since then I've met hundreds, and to be honest, I've not met one that I didn't like. And I've not met one that I didn't think, if I was in your position with the cards that you were dealt, I might have done the same thing. We're not talking about foolish, ignorant kids here. Though. We're talking about kids who look at their opportunities in life. And often, getting involved in drugs seems like the only way they can be able to buy the stuff that, that you referred to. And once they're in a drugs gang, it's extraordinarily difficult to be out again. I promise you. Um, Digny, I'll go to you, and then there's a hand up here somewhere. Uh, talking back to what you said, I do completely agree with the idea that if someone stabs you, they might not be trying to kill you, but you might end up accidentally getting seriously hurt. So I had a friend who was recently stabbed in the leg, and uh, they went for them, they were just trying to threaten them or hurt them or whatever. Was that at school? Was no, that? it wasn't at school, it was outside. And they went for them, and if it was a couple of inches to the left or whatever, they would have snapped the ligament in their leg, and they would have been unable to walk for the rest of their life. But as it stands, they were really lucky. It literally missed arteries, ligaments, everything. They were really, really lucky, and they're now pretty much fine. I also really worry sometimes that it's being normalised. So this person was stabbed, I think, about two months ago. And this person who I sit next to in classes, who I talk to, who I know quite well, I only found out about this a couple of days ago. And it felt so normalised. It felt like just talking about, oh, yeah, I was stabbed. It just didn't feel like a big deal. However, it should be a big deal that someone had a serious threat to their life and was seriously hurt, but everyone just kind of brushes it off and doesn't, it doesn't seem as if anyone cares enough to try and help you. Did, did that student have, did they talk about any of the other um, support that they've got in the lot? I know you only found out two, months, yeah. two days ago, but they, did they ever tell you about any other support they got? Because we mentioned trauma earlier, right, and helping people when this, the incidents happened. I know Lydia, you do a lot of work with that as well. Did they mention any support they got? No, not really. I just feel like it was one of those things where I live in um, East London and I go to Hyde Park School and I think a couple of kids have been kicked out of my ear for carrying knives, so it almost feels too normal sometimes, so I just think they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and got hurt. When you say talk much about it. When you, and when you say kicked out, do you know what's happened to those kids? Where they're oh, no, well, it's really strange with my school where they kick someone out and we, all the students aren't told anything until that kid who's been kicked out comes back to us and says, oh yeah, I was kicked out for doing this. We are literally told nothing. So not so long ago, two kids literally just disappeared and they were in my art class and everything. And I was talking to them and everything. One day they were there, the next day they weren't. And it's just like, what happened? A week later it came out that they were kicked out of the school for doing drugs in the school. But we weren't told any of this. And they just literally disappeared. And I worry for them because they will now be on the streets with no support, nothing to do at all. And 
things would go wrong. And I think it's quite fundamental, and I'm glad that you, and thank you for giving um, your point of view, because I think also what's missing from the conversation is young people. You know, we have these kind of big round table discussions and debates about what we think society should do or what we as adults should do, but we don't include that voice. And what these young people are saying, don't kick us out and not give us support. We're traumatized, we're suffering with undiagnosed trauma, we're frightened, we're scared. What do we do? And I think when we start to attempt to address just that alone, I think that our society will be in a better place. Well, we've actually got a young person with their hand up right here. Hi. Say hey, your name, sorry. Uh, my name is Olamide, and um, I wanted to address quite a, a lot of things that you've all mentioned. So with the um, violence and wanting to kill, I agree with you when you say that it's not the act to want to kill. It's more of a thing where if you do get in an altercation, it's a thing where you harm someone in, in order to get away, not harm someone in order to take their life. It's just for your own safety and your own protection. That's what I wanted to say about that. And with the normalization of knife crime within us, I don't know if you guys will agree, but when you hear that someone gets stabbed, you ask who? And it's a thing where you don't, how do I explain this? It's not, it's a thing where, it's not something like, oh wow, someone got stabbed. It's, it's not, it's wrong to say it's normal, but it's a, it's a thing that happens so often now. It's not something that we would go like wild about or we would talk about or be like, oh, did you hear that someone, this person got stabbed, da, 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 all of that. It's a thing where, because it's happened so frequently, especially in a, um, in like, I don't know how to word it, but the timings between them are so short. It's a thing where like, it's just happening all the time now. So it's nothing big. It's nothing, not that it's nothing big because it is a big situation, but it's nothing new. And um, with exclusions, I have like a big problem with PRUs. So pupil refer referral units and how like that creates like a school to prison pipeline. And it's a thing where they don't understand that the, the perpetrators are the victims at the same time. They're the ones who are at harm. And like, I've, uh, sorry, I don't really know how to phrase myself. This is quite nerve wracking. Um, you're doing well. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. I've, <laughs> I agree with you um, with the intersectionality and how that's so important because it's the thing where It's a thing where, because of, okay, majority of the black males who are causing this harm to other people, have you looked at their class? Have you looked at their race? Have you looked at the different things that will add or cause them to do such things? And it's a thing where, like, in the um, documentary, he said that I was confused, I'm scared. Why is he scared? Why is he confused? Do you understand? So it's, it's not a wanting to harm someone type of thing. It's just a... I want to be safe, and in order to be safe, I have to. Survive. I have to survive. survive. I have to survive, and I'm not. It's kind of like a kill or be killed kind of thing. I'm not going to lay my life on the line for someone I do not know or someone that's trying to harm me. And with the whole punching thing, yeah, I do agree that it takes courage to have like a fist fight instead of a knife, a knife fight, and. I wanted to say something about the intersectionality, so, um, yeah, about Prus. Sorry, I'm just waffling now. Um, <laughs> um, about Prus, and my big problem with them is that they feel like they have no hope and people don't believe in them anymore. And it's a thing where, like, when, when you are taken out of mainstream um, schools, are they being put back in? And if they're not, how does that then help them to progress in life? Because it's a thing where they're taken out of that. Do they have GCSEs? Do they have A-levels? If they don't, how they're supposed to go to uni, get a degree, get a good job? How do you expect them to do those things if you don't even give them the chance to do that? And it's really problematic because they make it seem like it's an intro thing, like it's just, it's just them lot. But it has to, like you were saying, it's our children, it's our, um, it's our community. Like you can't see it as just, 
um, a race problem or just a working class problem because it has to do with every single one of us because it's a community thing and we're all victims. As long as it's still there, we're all victims and anyone can get harmed. That's that's the thing about it. And it just happens to be mostly young black males. And yeah. So can you give a round of applause? <laughs> We're going to go to the chat at the back there. Um, uh, say your name, please. Uh, Zach. Zach. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm talking about. That's why I came here, to, to, to gain knowledge. But it seems that in London, this is mainly a black issue. And proportionately, I'm not sure again, but it seems that this is a black issue. Proportionately, not, not as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a black issue because Black people, not, not just black people, but black people are told that they have a bad hand in life. They're told that from the get-go, they're, they're condemned. They're, 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 they, they have a disadvantage. And people like to talk about different groups in life, gender, race, class. I feel like you're defeating the, the, the purpose in, in, in the first place because when, when, when you tell someone that they, that they have a disadvantage because of how they were born, you tell them that there is no aspiration and then the only place to go is down. It's, 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 it's hard to articulate this. But, yeah. No, I think you're, so you're talking about mainly about the way we're educating people at a young age, basically. Well, it's, it's, it's not education, yeah, but it's, it's more than education. It's, it's just a mindset. Okay. Um, uh, Socialization. If you tell them they're trash, they're going to act like trash. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it goes back into a deeper conversation. I think I'm, I'm going to attempt to try and unpick what you were saying, and I think it goes back to my point. And I know that it probably seems like it's a broken record, but it's not stressed enough in the literature about talking about this issue, about we live in an unequal society that doesn't include everyone. And we can go back to McPherson's report um, when Stephen Lawrence died, and what was his conclusion? That every institution in this country um, is institutionally racist. So if that is the case, that every institution, that at the root, um, in terms of their framework, their processes, their policies, and the implementation of those policies, then there's going to be a disadvantage when certain groups engage in those institutions, whether it be education, whether it be housing, whether it be jobs, whether it be within economics, whether it be in politics, whether it be policing or the application of policing, there's always going to be a disadvantage. So by default, what then happens is individuals will then tell their children about that system that they, by default, are going to be victims of. So I'm going to, the conversation that I'm going to have with my child as a black male is going to be very different to a white male living in society. Why? Because that white male that navigates in a British society doesn't have to think about race. When I walk down the road and I hear cars um, locking when I'm crossing the road or I'm in the university and I've got my university badge on and people are clenching their bags, why is that happening? Because we live in a society that is racialized and we need to be comfortable talking about race a lot more. And I think that when we start to apply that, then we start to look at our unconscious biases. Then we start to truly then look at, well, why is it then that I feel or think a particular type of way about particular groups within society? And how we knew that, we could just do a social experiment right now. I could guarantee if we were to all walk on the street right now and we've seen a group of young people walking down the road with hoods on their heads, subconsciously, you may not say it, but you're going to have a thought process that I can guarantee is either given to you by a media construct, told to you um, by somebody that you know closely, or an experience which is also valid as well. And oftentimes that is quite negative. So when young people look um, from particular groups in society and how they look at themselves, how are they depicted? They're not depicted as businessmen, they're not depicted as successful people unless they're sports stars or unless they're musicians. So again, when I feel like I'm a father trying to teach my child, I don't have to just teach him about education, which is brilliant, which all parents should do, but also have to teach him about survival.
And I'm not necessarily talking about the survival of being safe in the community. I'm also talking about that you actually might get nine times stuck more than your white friend. You actually might get sectioned under the Mental Health Act. You actually might get treated much harshly in institutions other than other children within society. So I think that's important that we understand the lens of the other. And I think that is probably my concluding point, that we need to start looking at, well, how do other people look, just like I'm not a woman, and understanding your point of view, and understanding your point of view, you have to also accept and understand my point of view. So when you want to understand violence, we have to look at different lenses with different people. So when I work with young people, I don't use the same rule for all of them. I enable them to tell me their story, I enable all of them to give me the tools to help me help them. And I think that's what our society needs to ultimately do. Um, to me, the issue starts at the individual. Um, and I, I, I hear this idea of institutional race, racism all the time, and I can't deny it, but I believe racism starts at the heart of the individual. And perhaps an institution is made up of loads of individuals who are racist, but I don't believe that something can be founded... So, some, something can come from racism, but I don't believe that something can um, exist through racism itself. I believe if you're racist and the next person next to you is also racist, then that, that, that forms the, the in, break down an institution that's made up of individuals. That's, that's where racism lies. And another point about the government. Uh, Government seems to be in the same situation, in, in, at, at least in a similar way with nuclear weapons. It's, it's, it's mutually assured destruction, and that's what seems to be happening with knife crime. It's that people have brought violence up to such a scale that you can't, you can't use your hands in a knife fight. So what else are you going to use? You're going to use knives. The government's in the same situation. The, the, the government doesn't have a clue how to sort this out. This, 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 this is a human issue. Um, Half these kids, they're not, they're, not, they're, they're, they're just frightened, you know. Um, they, I believe they don't want, they want to use a knife, but they're just, they're just put in a situation where, do you know what? All right, that guy's a lot bigger than me. If he's coming to fight me, how am I going to protect myself against him? You know what I mean? I'm not so much a bully, I don't want to kill him, but he's coming to fight me, and I need to protect myself against him, so the first thing I want to might want to do is stab him, yeah? Now, for my son's situation, I believe that boy who came down there, he was, he was a different kettle of fish. He came down there to do one thing and one thing only. He came down to that to my son's school just to cause destruction. He didn't come for my son, he came for another boy. He didn't see this boy. He just took it out and the first kid he knew come from a certain area and said, you know what? And he stabbed him three times. So his, his intention was to come down to cause destruction. That's just one in so many. You've got, you know, three quarters of these lads, they do not want to be in violence, but they're just, Drawn in because they want to be protected, they, they want to feel safe. You go to them and they will tell you, do you know what, I carry it um, just for protection. <laughs> you know, because they do not feel safe. So I, mean, I think one of the things we can't do as well is conflate and put all young people in one category. Mm -hmm. There are some young people, which is the vast majority, and mm -hmm. that's been pointed out, that carry knives because they're scared. But I work on the other side where young people carry knives because they like to hurt young, other young people. Um, <laughs> and it's nothing to do with their fear. They solely do it because they want to hurt other young people. So again, when we're talking about the point again earlier about the culture of violence, it's about analyzing, or for me, looking at, well, how did we arrive at this particular place? I would say at one point, possibly it was fear, but then what's it become? And then how do we solve that problem? Because working with a young man that is on the periphery of violence, that carries a knife because it's fashionable, is very different from a young person that carries a knife because he feels that he wants to use it in a situation where he may be a victim and he uses it because he's scared versus a young person that says, you know what, well, I just want to kill young people because he's not from my area, because I don't like the look of him. And I think that it's important that we, well, for me anyway, that distinguishes the difference between the two, uh, more importantly, because the intervention and the strategy wouldn't be the same. Some, as you say, who are seriously damaged, and they will admit all they want to do is to hurt other kids. And one of the problems in the system at the moment is that the police and the judiciary system is not able to recognise the difference between the two, because how you intervene with them is very, very different. 
And the kid that really wants to hurt somebody with intense intervention, it's possible to <coughs> change that, but it's very hard work and it needs an awful lot of effort. But it's, it's not a lost cause, because there are reasons why they're like that and they, they need to deal with it. But it's, it's in the minority, yes. I would say. There are not many kids like that. They haven't had the help and support to, to be able to navigate through that experience. Yeah. I was the lady who was on the dock for me, who got 12 and a half years was no remorse, and you'll probably hear this with most of the bereaved mothers that stand on the court deck, there was never remorse, because they haven't been able to identify where it all comes from yet, and they haven't had the support to be able to, to guide them. Oh, we've got loads of hands up, and we've actually run out of time, so actually, what we will do, we're going to have just one more, I think. Yeah. Go on. Right, later in the back, it's all yours. Oh, thank you. Um, so last year, my sister's boyfriend was stabbed in a gang-related attack, and he since and he hasn't had really any support in his childhood. And since then, he's moved into our house. And basically, I've learned so much from him in this time about his adverse child experiences. And Lydia, I was very interested in what you were saying about trauma and when you don't get it very, you, when you don't get the support very young, that it kind of sets this path for you. And he is the most amazing, sweet, kind, incredible boy that has been dealt the worst hand in life. And I know a lot of the conversations have been going back to how when we don't have the right support and people aren't given the right support, they adopt surrogate families, they want surrogate safety, they want basically when they they look for in groups which might have more violence embedded in them what they're not getting in other areas of their lives. And I know you met you've been talking about government support, but I was wondering if you could go into maybe a little bit more detail about what kind of forms of support this should be, whether it's youth clubs, I know you mentioned the church and kind of how we can move forward in early intervention and protecting these young people when they're vulnerable. Well, actually, Lydia mentioned the Chicago model, and yeah. I was looking at the Glasgow model, which is for early intervention, but you mentioned the Chicago, and I know we spoke about it as well. Can you explain mm. what the Chicago model is? I don't really know. I guess it's a holistic and mental health approach as well, um, but I, I don't know. All I know is it, it, stri it stripped me down from every single thing that I've been been and that was your boot camp was it that was a boot camp that I went on yeah um it just it just gives you the opportunity to to look at your life in a different aspect to to question to to, to depict to understand and to navigate and to give you tools to be a better person in society that's what it was for me that's what it was so the Chicago model um, ultimately was a public health model to respond into violence so their understanding was that if we are talking about any aspect of violence, the reason why we're doing it wrong is because we're looking at it through a criminal justice lens. And we need to look at it and we need to understand it as a public health issue because violence is a disease and it spreads as such. So if violence is a disease and it spreads as such, then we need to use a model that's embedded in public health in order to respond to the issue. Um, so what Chicago adopted was a model that was holistic, that looked at all elements um, of health, mental health, um, looking at communities, looking at aspects of violence, um, points of when violence um, may be triggered, points at how violence escalates. And what they did was created a kind of um, an intervention um, that kind of engaged with all of that throughout process. So for a perfect example, someone gets stabbed in London. What happens? That kid goes to the hospital. Who's left at the scene? The community, children, young people. Everybody's panicking. Everybody's on their phones talking about <laughs> such and such that got stabbed. The young man goes to the hospital, everybody goes to the hospital, loads of stuff going on inside the trauma unit, and parents outside, children are also outside wondering what's going on. Whilst all of that's happening, messages are being sent around the community, such and such has been stabbed, and we know who did it. So the police don't know yet, because they're still trying to find out and trying to make sense. But the community already know the problem, and guess what happens? People get the message, people start passing that message, and an incident may happen somewhere else, that is related to the issue, but still those in authority don't understand the issue. So a public health model from a Chicago approach was that we intervene at that point. So that meant that you had youth workers, you had mental health workers, you had loads of different people coming from different um, sectors that engage with young people at that particular moment. So one of the, um, for those that are interested, you might want to look at Operation Ceasefire. Um, so they use the um, public health approach. And some of you may have watched the documentary Violent Interrupters. And that shows how whilst an individual wants to shoot someone, a youth worker stayed with them inside their house, outside their house, and said, we're not leaving each other until you calm down. And it showed an individual that was prepared to shoot another young man, go from up there, down. And I think that is the intervention. 
Um, so in my opinion, when we're talking about how this country can move forward, I think there needs to be a complete paradigm shift. So yes, we keep hearing these narratives from the Lord, from, from the um, London Mayor and other people talking about public health approaches. I don't think people nationally understand what that means. My critique is it can't just be London and it can't just be Birmingham. It needs to be citywide, especially if we're talking about things like county lines and we're talking about um, organisations moving young people into different boroughs and different regions. That's not going to be affected. It needs to be a national analysis on what the problems are, including young people's perspectives and people from all sectors. But it needs to be community-led and academically focused. And I'll say it again, it needs to be community-led. That doesn't mean that community people, stakeholders in the community, are used up until a certain point. And then it's like, well, thanks for all of your information. We don't need you no more. And it kind of the smiles demonstrate to me that we work for organizations and being amongst those groups where we see that happen quite frequently. And that's why Chicago was so effective. The reason why I would look at Chicago as opposed to Glasgow is the demographic of Glasgow was slightly different and the interventions that was used, a lot of them were police-led, not all. Um, I think that I like the Chicago model better, and I think if we could use that and adapt it. But again, it goes back to the original point, do we want to do it? And I think we also accept that if, it, if we are to use a, a model as such, it's going to take us at least 10 years to get out of what's happened since the recession, so that's 10, and then starting again 10 years' time of where we can go from again because Glasgow took numbers of years in order to see a reduction. For those that don't know, Glasgow was a knife crime capital for a long time. So then when we talk about predominantly you know, specific groups, we then say, well, that Piers Morgan narrative is a little bit <laughs> late and it's a bit wrong, isn't it? But it's important that we understand that. So I think if we're talking about real change, one, it's about understanding models that have been used around the world to reduce violence. And secondly, do we really want to do it as a society? Um, and if we don't, then we need to think about um, interventions or alternatives to do that. And I'm saying, if we talk about the birth of youth work in this country, started with religious organisations, maybe we need to rein them back in and say, you know what, <laughs> we need to find a new way of understanding charity. So it's not necessarily about charity um, in terms of food, in terms of poverty, but it's also about charity and poverty of the mind, which I think is most important because we're trying to change mindsets. Because as I said, it's all of our children that are being effective and not just mine. Just as much as I would hope that I'm looking after your children in schools every single day going around the country, I would expect if my son's walking down the road, you don't target him and mistreat him or think that he's doing something negative. And I think if we can reciprocate the love that I give to your children in the work I do every single day, I would love for my son to walk up the road and feel the same love coming from all communities. And I, I, can, I can definitely vouch you do give a good hug because we hugged each other outside and it was quite a good hug. Um, okay, well, thanks for that. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, there's obviously, like, loads of things to unpack, um, and I don't know how we even begin to unpack them. I think, actually, it started lots of new conversations for us, which is exactly what we should be doing. So all these thinkings are about, actually, where do we go to next and what do we do next? Um, and I think there's just, there's just three things that just have stuck with me, is this whole thing around normalization in schools like it's just normal it's just normal you didn't find out about it Digby you know you didn't know about it and how these incidents are happening and now we're just taking them for like it's just happening and it's rising and it's just happening and actually well, how are we supporting these kids after what are we doing about it I think the other thing that was really interesting Craig and you rightly pointed out was actually when we're talking about race let's unpack that properly let's unpack it properly let's not look at it through the narrative of only black men, let's open it up a little bit more and say actually where else is it happening and how is it being tackled and why is it that the media, and I point at myself here, what, why are we doing the thing we always consistently do and, and push a certain narrative and I think that's absolutely right, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, I think the, the other really interesting thing is about the, the victim and uh, I know Paul, you've obviously been through something so horrific and you know from the bottom of my heart, I'm so, just so happy that you could be here today and share that. And I'm sure everyone in the room you know, really appreciates you doing that. Because I know how hard it's been for you, but we, we really appreciate that here at Tortoise and everyone in the room. But I think you made a really good point about kids and fear. And, and there was also that counterpoint, which is actually some people do just want to hurt. And there's got to be a different approach to both <coughs> these types of people, because that's the only way to fix it. Um, it. It does seem like it's a public health issue. 
and Prus was mentioned a couple of times as well and you know there's different methods that are out there and I think one thing we're definitely going to look at is how these um, referral units are working actually and what they do it how they're setting people up for life later on because it definitely feels like they're not doing that they've only recently just opened up a school in liverpool that solely focuses on their first childhood experiences so right. they implement that in the whole curriculum okay and it's it's doing ex exceptionally well okay well, there you go i would say that would be something that it's needs important to be. also that you know we're all part of a lot of lobbying around Ofsted. Um, and the Department of Education acknowledging yeah. all of these issues. It was only October that they released the, the recent um, statutory guidelines and they spoke about those things about excluding kids from, children, from school. Yeah. And one of my arguments is that, you know, kicking them out of school because they've got a knife, is that probably the best idea? You know, unpacking why. Yeah. I work with yeah. loads of kids that carry knives to school because something happened on the school bus the night before and they were unwilling to tell mum and dad what happened and therefore they just thought, I'm going to carry a knife, put it in my bag. Someone's reported that to the teacher and they've been kicked out, so that needs to be unpacked versus a child that probably carries a knife yeah. because they generally want to cause problems in school. There are two different types of characters. If they both end up in a pupil referral unit, then the school to prison pipeline, as one of the young people um, mentioned, start to like, start, again. starts yeah. on the... Um, so anyway, yeah, so thanks for that. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. We certainly did. And um, yeah, if you're not a member of Tortoise, make sure you sign up and come to another thinking. Thank you.